Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn Kenny, and here this week, this month, we're talking on Bloom Brain Smarts with some of the biggest experts around uh, the world in brain health. And we have Dr. David Nowell here, a longtime friend, a wonderful uh, board certified child neuropsychologist who's going to chat with us a little bit about executive function assessment. David, people get confused. They get referred for a neuropsychological assessment. They get referred to understand, do their kids have executive function dysfunction? Help us understand where we're to begin as, as parents, teachers, and clinicians. So, um, you know, Lynn, executive functioning is a word that's gotten a lot of traction uh, in the past five or 10 years. And I think in our field as psychologists, we first started hearing it maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And at this point, lots of, um, clinicians and lots of lay people use the term executive functioning and we think we know what it means but if anybody ever stopped us and said okay what is executive functioning we would realize that it's a it's a word we use like team pride or Christmas spirit we don't really know what it is like if you know how do we measure Christmas spirit or how do you measure team pride it's sort of a vague it's executive functions include a whole list of concepts and terms that speech therapists and psychologists have made up there's no such thing as working memory or divided attention i can't show you a square yard or a pound of working memory i can't show you a spec scan and say oh lynn look there's the divided attention you know there's the initiation the reason that these terms like initiation uh, set shifting um freedom from distractibility, the reason those terms are useful is that if you and I and the OT are sitting down scratching our heads about a 13-year-old who has trouble getting up in the morning or an eight-year-old who has trouble um, you know, inhibiting blurting out comments or a 15-year-old who has trouble starting a yucky task like homework, we might say, well, is it initiation? Is it the willingness to persist with a non-preferred task? So these are useful concepts, but they're not real things. So when a clinician does an executive functioning assessment, he or she is trying to drill down into the specific areas of weakness that, that a classroom teacher would see, that a parent would see. Um, now there's a number of tests which tap into executive functioning. And it's important when you're seeking a neuropsychological evaluation to talk to the clinician, what is your approach to executive functioning? And I think this is a good question what tests would you use to assess executive functioning? And if he or she lists two or three tests, that's good. But even better, the answer I would want to hear is, Lynn, every psychological test is a test of executive functioning. In fact, even sitting down in the waiting room for your adult clients and filling out the paperwork takes executive functioning because executive function impacts every single test that makes up the cognitive battery for a speech therapist or a neuropsychologist. For example, one of the subtests from a typical IQ battery is called the block design subtest, and it's a measure of visual spatial functioning. It requires a subject to put red and white blocks together to make increasingly complex designs within a time limit. Now, there are two ways to get a score of zero on the block design subtest. One is, you're taking high doses of seizure medications and you're just a bit slowed down. So you get every item correct, even the very hard items correct, but two seconds over the time limit. That's a score of zero. The other way to get a score of zero is to eat the blocks. <laughs> Both of those patients have the same block design subtest. Those are two very different ways of getting um, uh, a score of zero. Another example from the IQ battery uh, the mathematics subtest, a series of increasingly complex math questions designed to tap into uh, your math capacity. So one of the items might be, Linda has seven yellow paper clips, eight red paper clips, and four purple paper clips. She reaches in and pulls out a paper clip without looking. What are the odds that she'll pull out a yellow paper clip? You've got 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. If you get that item right, I can say you have good math skills. If you don't get that item right, it's important for the clinician to ask, how exactly did you miss that item? Was it English language learner? Was it uh, marijuana abuse? Was it head injury? Is it language? Is it auditory processing? Is it executive functioning or is it math? So in fact, I think every task in our battery is in a measure of executive functioning. And I would wanna see a skillful clinician who was able to take that approach to the battery. Even the way that you, um, 
you approach a paper and pencil math test, you'll notice that students with ADHD will often make errors like 6 minus 2 equals 8. That's not a math error. That's an executive error. And they'll do that in the classroom. They'll see the plus sign and read it as a minus sign. So the approach that I want to recommend for an executive assessment is to um, look at each failure and ask how exactly did they do that. That's why I do my own testing. Um, right. I, I don't have a, techno a, a technician do my testing because I want to, if you get all my tests right, you're boring me. But if you <laughs> get to make errors, then it's interesting because I get to say how exactly did you make those errors and how does that map on to what the parent sees at home and what the teacher and paraprofessional and OT see in the school setting. But that's so, my so approach. I, and you make me laugh so hard. I mean, first of all, I, I agree with you just 10 trillion times. I, you know, I'm really seeing a lot of people doing testing and looking at the numbers but not being qualitative. Right. right. They're also not matching the test to the specific executive functions because there are so many executive functions. And I do the same thing you do. I, in one of my talks, I say, are they real? You know, they're not really real and they're a function of electricity and we just name yep. them, categorize them in order to better understand them. I think that's really, really super adorable that you do that. So the yep. thing is, for the people who, you know, there are teachers, there are principals participating in Bloom Brain Smarts. I'm thinking that what I hear you saying is, one, you've got to really know what the referral questions are. What are the specific challenges that the child is having? And it's not just what are the executive functions, because there's tons of them, maybe up to 50, right? Depending on right. how you label them. Right. So what, what exactly is the concern? Is it initiation? Is it execution, like you said? Is it, um, is it you know, making transpositional challenges? What, what is the problem? Then the good clinician can intuit, well, this might be the executive function, then the good clinician can match a test to the executive function. But overall, what you've said brilliantly today is that you're always observing human behavior. With yeah. your own eyes, it's a good high quality clinician. You're not just taking the data. You're saying, what is this child's approach? How do they enter into the tasks? Yes. When I test the limits, how is it they're doing, et cetera, et cetera, right? Right. <laughs> this is why I always want to interview you because I think you're you're fabulous. Now, let me ask you this: Why doesn't everyone else think this way, David? Why aren't people being? And there are some great, great, great clinicians, school psychologists who are great, educational psychologists. You don't have to be a board certified neuropsychologist to be really, you know, competent. But why why have we missed the boat on this a little bit? Matching exactly what the challenge is with the test, and then looking at what's the kid's approach, not just What's the number? You know, Lynn, I think that once people are exposed to this way of thinking about executive functioning, it's so intuitive, and it fits with the classroom teacher's experience. It fits with uh, you know, any of us who work with children. Um, it, I think once we're exposed to this model, this is what makes sense. Because when you start talking about executive functions in those little categories, you can see people's eyebrows wrinkling up like they're trying to memorize something. When you talk about it the way you and I are talking about it, the, the scales fall off and they're like, oh, I get it. So it means we have to be really client specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, yeah, you want to add more? Because I mean, you I do. Um, so if you are a parent or a clinician interested in, in more about executive function, I would recommend anything that Dr. Lynn Kinney has <laughs> written or is working on. Uh, if you're a parent, I would recommend Smart But Scattered. Yeah. If you're an adult with ADD, I'd recommend anything by Ari Tuckman. And if you're a school psychologist, Run, don't walk, and right. get anything by Dr. George McCloskey. I agree. Although I still, I still got to interview him because I don't understand a few of his definitions. But <laughs> that's just because his brain's so much bigger than mine. I mean, you and I are more of the in the trenches people. You know what I mean? Always matching up. Well, how is the kid approaching it? What's their, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I thank you warmly. Now, listen, um, I really want to interview you again because I want to talk about the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, and the amygdala. Some of the, some of the parts of the brain that we're very interested in. That everyone is, else is busy talking about the cortex. So I'm thinking. Next Bloom Brain Smarts chat, let's talk about those other parts of the brain that we love that everyone ignores. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks a million, David. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, talk soon.